Welcome to the aristocracy. How are you guys all doing? Okay, so there's a lot to talk about here. Um, basically, yeah, I mean, big process, you are totally welcome to disagree. 100%. I'm not going to be right on everything. And as I mentioned, my expertise is not in the current political situation. My, my expertise is in the history of the situation. So that's going to give me a really good context. But there's all these other aspects about the current political si si situ like situation, to, especially to do with political theory um, and the ins and outs of what's going on in the Middle East right now that, you know, I could totally be wrong about. That's why I always encourage you guys to fact check anything I say. On the Prime channel you went on, Prime said BDSM movement a bunch. Oh yeah, that's he's probably had sex on his mind. He, he looked a little bored, so that makes sense. Just making sure you've seen that someone redeemed the inner life word banned for the word um. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. Um, is that a new background? Um, yeah, it is. It's just temporary. Um, but I don't know if I'll keep it. I'll see. I just asked about withdrawing funding because Liz Warren argued that continuing defending funding by st but stopping is being used in the occupied territories. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, that's an interesting theory. I really think um, when I think about what's useful for the conflict, I just think about de-radicalizing. Um, de-radicalizing Israelis and de-radicalizing um, uh, Palestinians. And de-radicalizing Israelis is the biggest deal right now because this whole situation has been started by a kind of movement that's slowly been gaining power within Israel, um, which is a Jewish nationalist movement. And this is something that I think the media has really gotten wrong when covering this story. And I think in general, people have gotten, people are thinking that there's two groups at play. There's Palestinians and there are the, and the Israelis. And it's not like that. Um, there were basically, especially if we're talking about the Jerusalem situation of what happened yesterday, there were three groups at play. So you had the Israeli police, so the Israelis, you had the Jewish nationalists, which yes, were, I know that sounds weird to you, but they were a different group. You have to understand that there is a group of Jewish nationalists now who literally want to, they are very, very religious, they're dogmatic, they want to kick out um, Arabs from the country. They want to destroy Al-Aqsa Al Mosque. Um, okay, yeah, they want to destroy the mosque. Um, they want, they, because the mosque is built on the original area of where the Jewish temple was. That's why just outside, there's like a, um, there's a wall, right? That, that's the, the Western wall that Jews pray at. It's one of the walls of the, of the ancient temple. Um, but so they basically see, they see Muslims in the region as the original, you know, conquerors, occupiers, right? And that their, and that their land has been taken from them and they want to get rid of, um, the mosque. They want to get rid of Muslims and Arabs like in the area and basically make it all Jewish. And then on top of that, they probably want the state to also start following Jewish, like a uh, formal law, um, which is like the Jewish version of Sharia. To a sense, people seem to be more familiar with Sharia. Can you give a name for the group? Because I know they started, but I can't find any mention of their name. Um, are you called talking about Kahanas? Do you have any tips on how we avoid being anti-Semitic? Oh my God, Hojek, that is... Honestly, the biggest ways I like... Yeah, that's, that's a whole stream in and of itself. I might dedicate um, tomorrow's stream to that. We'll see. Are there actually any serious plans to build a temple? No, there are no serious plans to build a temple, but they just, they want that, they want that gun. The biggest thing is that the area, here, let me show you guys some. Okay. So this area, this area of Al-Aqsa Mosque, do you guys like see over here? Oh wait, no, it's not showing. One second. Oh, 
Okay, now it's working. Okay. Shut up, very Okay, so this area, if you guys see over here, um, like this area, Jews are not allowed here, right? Um, and Jews are not allowed here for security reasons. Now, religious Jews find this very offensive, as you can imagine, right? They find it anti-Semitic, and they, they're not allowed there by Israeli law, right? Like the Israeli police don't allow them. You're probably like, oh, that's so weird. Why are Jews not allowing other Jews there? That's so strange. Um, you have to understand that there are different factions within like, you know, Jewish culture and Israeli culture and all that stuff. And there's aspects that want to kind of, you know, remain peaceful. Um, and so there are all these rules that are about maintaining the peace of Jerusalem. Um, because keep in mind, there's three major religions that are in Jerusalem. They are not allowed there because of security concerns that there's going to be clashes, right? You have to understand like the amount of history that is in this region. If you just look, if you look at the picture right now, the the temple, the Jewish temple used to be right here. It was destroyed. It wasn't destroyed by Muslims, right? It was destroyed twice. There were two temples. But on the rubble of where it was destroyed, right, the reason why Jews haven't been able to rebuild a temple, like, is because the Dome of the Rock was built there which is Al-Aqsa Mosque. So, Jews get, so religious Jews find this very, very offensive, right? That like their holy ground is kind of being desecrated by another religion um, and, to, and stolen from them. That's the attitude. So when they go there, and this is why Muslims are so concerned about Al-Aqsa Mosque being destroyed, um, because they don't trust Israel to not they don't trust israel to be protecting it but israel is technically protecting it right now though obviously after yesterday it's um a little in question so jews basically what is this ad that's over here that's real weird um so jews are not allowed to come here now jews want to come to the temple mount and they want to pray it's a very very it's literally the holiest site in judaism so they want to go and they pray and they and they can't pray. This is very, very upsetting for them. Now, they can't go pray, again, to keep the peace of Jerusalem because if you have a lot of Orthodox Jews, mostly Jewish men, that are going to be there, there's a lot of Muslim men there. It's just like basically asking for trouble. Like it's just asking for trouble. Um, so they, they, there are all these like little rules in Israel, especially in the old city of like um, where they're trying, where they made like allocations and deals with imams and rabbis, all these kind of deals to try to keep the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah, no, the mosque is also very, very old. So um, it would be upsetting if your prayer was interrupted in Israel. Yeah, so Jews are very upset that they can't pray there. Right? This is a, a very, very intense point, and this is one of the reasons, this is one of the things that divides um, nationalist and very, very religious Jews versus more moderate um, Jews in Israel. Okay, And now keep in mind, the more nationalist Jews, they are the minority, but they're a very vocal minority, and they have a lot of power because of coalitions. And they've been growing and growing in number, right? They have more children. We talked about, I talked about this a little on the panel the other day. Um, they've been growing in number, um, and again, you know, as Palestinians, like, the more radicalized Palestinians become and the more attacks that happen, the more those kind of Jewish nationalist groups grow in number as well. So they've been gaining more and more power over time. Now, this year, they had decided that they wanted to do, to do a special kind of, like, demonstration, because they're upset that they can't go pray at the temple now. Like, I'm not allowed to go there. What do moderate Jews think should happen to this building? Moderate Jews think that this building should be protected, um, that it's an important part of history, that yeah, it's sad the temple got, um, the, the temple was originally destroyed, um, but you know, you can't just erase what happened in history, it's already happened and you don't wanna just do more harm. That's what most moderate Jews believe. It's a standard opinion, no one really, most Israelis do not want the Dome of the Rock on, which is why Israel protects it. So, 
And this is an important fact, right? So that's why there's this tension between moderate Jews and very and more extremist nationalist Jews. So I, I think this this difference is really, really important to understand when you're looking at the population and not just grouping all Israelis together. Because I think I'm seeing, especially on Twitter, like people just acting like they're this one monolithic group and it's not true. And we're gonna get into why this is really important as when how the this issue starts. So basically what ends up happening is most Israelis think the Messiah will rebuild the temple. Um, yeah, uh, well, not most Israelis. I mean, yeah, that's that's a, it depends on most Jews probably do, like if they're religious. Anyways, so um, Jews are upset that they can't go and they can't pray at the Dome of the Rock, right? Or like, sorry, not the Dome of the Rock, but the Temple Mount. Um, and Muslims, on the other hand, are very, very concerned, right? So Alaska Mosque is um, their third most important religious site, right? Um, this is the place where Muhammad was said to ascend to heaven. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Muslims. Like, if I get my is my Islam wrong, you know, I didn't do lots of, uh, I didn't do that great in my Islamic classes, so feel free to correct me. Um, but this is the place where Muhammad went, um, excited, uh, exceeded to like to heaven. So it's a very, very, very holy place. I mean, like, look at this fucking beautiful building. Kind of demonstrates enough um, uh, how holy of a place this is to Muslims. So you can imagine how Muslims around the world are very, very, very concerned um, about the fact that uh, one of their holiest places is now under control of Israel and not a Muslim government. Most of the other holy places, the, I think the other two holy places like the Hajj and stuff are, like, are both under control of Muslim governments. So this is a place of, so this is a source of huge anxiety for Muslims around the world. Because they're very concerned that all you need is that Jewish nationalist to start, the, them to start really becoming dominant in the Israeli government. And then voila, what happens if it, it gets destroyed? There's tons of rumors that get spread around Muslim communities that Israel's already planning on destroying it. That's not true but I understand why they're concerned. Is the attack related to uh, the potential for another Israeli election? I, I don't know. I might be wrong on that, but I don't think so. Um, but anyways, so this is like, those are the tensions. I'm just trying to give you kind of like the, you know, the, I guess, the basic setting, the historical setting of why this stuff feels like a big deal. So, there had already been rising tensions because of the Sheikh Jarrah situation, right? The Sheikh Jarrah situation um, is something I can get into explaining that, but it's also a really, really complex thing. I guess I'll tell you guys like the basics where there was and there is a neighborhood um, in East Jerusalem. Now, East Jerusalem is technically an occupied territory, right? It was not allocated to Israel during the original UN partition that we talked about in 1948. Now, before 1948, Jews lived in East Jerusalem. And Muslims and Palestinians lived in West Jerusalem. They lived in both. There wasn't like this kind of uh, like, you know, divide. So they lived in Jerusalem um, and the and so Jews like owned some, some portions of the land, right? Um, there's a lot of complexities on what this ownership means and a lot of issues. I, if you guys were here for, you know, when I talked about the economics of early Palestine, you'll kind of understand that with the feudalism aspect. But just for the sake of this conversation, we'll just say Jews owned certain areas of East Jerusalem, certain areas were owned by Muslims, etc. Right? It was like kind of sprinkled around. Now, what happened in 1948, we talked about this before on my stream, is in 1948, um, Israel wins the war, but a lot of people forget this. So did Jordan. Now, Jordan officially loses the war on the outside with the other Muslim nations, but secretly it's working with Israel. We find this out 30 years later. And Jordan takes on, takes half of Jerusalem, takes East Jerusalem for its own. Whoa, thank you so much for the, <laughs> thank you, Arisan, for yes. the, um, thank you for the, uh, for the dono. I'll move to the hot tub soon, all right? Um, so where was I? I was distracted by hot tub. Um, so Jordan takes 
over this this region right of east jerusalem now the problem is is that east jerusalem is not divided and jerusalem is not divided into muslims and jews on one side and sorry jews on one side and muslims on one the other side so what ends up happening is there is an ethnic cleansing of both right and it's i don't know or an ethnic exchange depending on your politics it's a complicated thing what you want to take right jews believe it was an ethnic cleansing it's like i don't know it's, yeah that's a you can guess what you want so the jews were removed basically jordan collaborated with israel oh i can do a whole stream about that i've talked about it before but yeah jordan did collaborate with israel they were collaborating the whole time um jordan was sharing information with israel the real conspiracy in history. You can read about it in Collusion Across the Jordan by Avi Schlein. Um, so anyways, so in Jerusalem, uh, in East Jerusalem, what happens when Jordan takes over in 1948, Israel gets established as a state, but it's not including East Jerusalem. This is very, very important. What ends up happening is Jews end up being kicked out of their homes in East Jerusalem and they move to Israel. Some, I mean, they might have moved to the U.S. Devil Dances, thank you so much for that sub. Really appreciate you sticking by. So, they end up, um, so they end up moving out of Jordan and being so-called ethnically cleansed, right? Now, I'm just using that. It's not a technical legal, legal term since it gets thrown around all the time. So, take what you will. Take that with a grain of salt. Now, what happens is Palestinians have what we have what what has just happened in 1948 right palestinians have been ethnically cleansed tons of arabs have lost their homes due to the war of 1948 so they naturally take the land that they can get um and some of that is that land right so there is a population exchange jews moving from jordan right from what is now jordan okay and palestinians palestinian refugees moving into what is now jordan east jerusalem yeah, the problem with ethnic cleansing is um, there's no legal definition. So ethnic cleansing can mean anything that people want it to mean, but I can I can tell you what the standard definition is, um, uh, which is basically just the forcible removal of a population, um, usually based on ethnicity. But weren't Jews a minority in Jerusalem pre-1948? Um, yeah, I think they were. But they were still sprinkled in different areas. They still owned certain parts of the land. There were still a lot of Jews in, in, in Jerusalem in 1948. So there have always been Jews in Jerusalem. They've never left, right? There was just, there was a huge era, like era of diaspora and stuff. Though we are bringing on an ancient historian to talk about that shit this, uh, this Sunday. But I was going to announce that later. Ethnic cleansing is not genocide. So, um... I, I can get into the the biggest difference is genocide is a legal term and ethnic cleansing is a social term that's um, used usually by people when they don't want to say the word genocide um, or they don't have the proof of a genocide happening. But it, it got popularized during the Serbian genocide. Anyways, hey, Krami. Hello, hello. So there's a population exchange, right? Um, so that's when Palestinian refugees move into Jordan. Um, and they become, they don't gain, most don't, don't gain Jordanian citizenship. Most end up becoming, uh, still staying refugees. Um, but you know, all, they take some homes in East Jerusalem. Now East Jerusalem is under control of Jordan. This remains so until 1967, right? Remember 1967, that's a big war. That's the war where, um, that's literally the war where, um, Israel starts occupying territories illegally because Israel wins that war. And so Israel wins the war in 1967. They take back Jerusalem. Now, can you guys guess like what day that is, right? It's called Jerusalem Day in the Israeli calendar. Sorry, calendar, calendar. Why did Jordan kick out the Jews in East Jerusalem if they were collaborating? Um, because they the collaboration was not like an official collaboration. They weren't, keep in mind, is, Jordan was not collaborating with Israel because it liked Jews or it liked Israel or anything. It was collaborating because they wanted more land, right? It was like, enemy of the enemy is my friend, useful situation. 
It was not an actual, like, al- like it wasn't a real allyship or, like, alliance. When is an understatement? Yeah, for the Six-Day War, yeah. So Israel wins 1967. We talked a bit about the Six-Day War. I think I did a whole stream about it. Big, big, big deal, right? Um, and now suddenly Israel is occupying. They've taken all this land, way more land than they have right now. They've taken all this land. The really important parts, especially that what we're talking about is um, they take East Jerusalem and they unify Jerusalem, right? So this is a really big deal. And this is a very big deal for religious and nationalist Jews. Remember that 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 group that I told you about from the beginning that's that really wants uh, Alaska Ma, Alaska Mosque gone, right? For for that group of Jews, this is a very very important moment, right? Because Jerusalem becomes united. I don't want to say Zionist affinity because there's a lot of Zionists that don't agree with it. Anyways, um, you have to understand that Zionists originally accepted East Jerusalem not being theirs. In 1948 but anyways it's just a semantic debate so um hey i would like you to check my homework oh i don't you don't have to pay me for the pleasure um so basically what happens is uh where was i where, where, where was i um jerusalem 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 um yeah so jerusalem gets united now this day um in you know israeli history is called jerusalem day or you you're um uh, so very, very, very big deal. What yesterday was Jerusalem day or was it Sunday? I think it was yesterday. Depends on time zones. So yesterday was a Jerusalem day, right? This is not a coincidence that the day that East Jerusalem gets united with West Jerusalem, right? It's a very, very big deal because it was the first time, cause you have to understand that it, Originally, in the original UN partition in 1948, um, Israel did not have control over the Western Wall. So Jews could not pray at the holiest site that they could. So it's like they owned their holy country, but they couldn't pray at the site that was the kind of the whole fucking point. So religious Jews kind of were not down with Israel until they got to 1967. Because once they got to 1967, they're like, oh, well now, now you guys might be useful because now we can pray at the wall. So there are all these like big pictures of Jews praying at the wall. I'll show you guys. You know, a very big moment in, you know, Jewish Israeli history. Right, like the, when this was going on. This picture is very, very famous where some Israeli soldiers, they just won the 1967 war, and they finally get to pray at the wall for the first time as Jews. You can imagine from a religious perspective why it means a lot. Oh, yeah, I know I have a lot of tabs. But, uh, yeah, you can imagine how much that means, right? Um, it, It means a lot to someone who's very, very religious, and even for people who weren't religious, it was an important historical moment. Like I know when I've, uh, I've been able to go to the wall three times in my life, they were both like, I am not a religious person, but they are both very meaningful experiences. You know, because there's a lot of history there. It's a thousand, it's it's like thousands of years old. It's over 2000 years old. It's a big deal, right? Um, and there are all these like kind of myths. You put like a letter, there's a myth within, I mean, myth or tradition within Jewish culture where you write, um, you write a letter to God, um, and you put it in the wall. Everyone puts little notes in the wall, like all the edges of the wall and like the stones are all covered, filled with notes. And that it's said that God will always listen to your, to your prayers, right? Um, that you put in the wall and you know, I don't know if it's just coincidence, but Every single time, every single prayer I put into that wall, even though I don't believe in God, every single time, all of those things happened. I like, I prayed for someone to survive their cancer. It happened. Um, I prayed to, you know, to finish, to be successful in my exam that year. I did it. Like all those things. I got that shit. Um, really weird. I don't know, you know, but anyways, that was a random anecdote. Um, yeah, so I'm just trying to demonstrate 
why this shit is so intense for so many people. And especially I think for outsiders, it's really hard to understand why this area is such a big deal. And there's so much high emotions in it because there's so much history and religion and associations with both with the, with this exact area, right? Like this temple, like this area, this wall, um, it's so emotional for Jews and the Mount right here, what's going on right there, right? There's the, there, there's Alaska Mosque, right? Um, so this area is just so, so holy. It's like holy times a billion. You could have ended World Hunger and Wish to Fish. Okay, I was like 12 years old, fantasy, right? Um, you know, give me a break. At least, you know, some someone got cured by cancer. Yeah, so you could just imagine. It's like almost when you think about it, like how could there not be conflict when there's so many intense emotions and so much history and so much burnt, um, dark periods of history all melded together in this tight region. So, anyways. So, it's a very, very big deal. Oh, Syphos, no, you can't leave. It's a very important stream. Okay. So, it's a very, very, very important area. Um, don't worry, I will get to the terrible takes. People want me to explain the situation. So, 1967, um, Jerusalem gets united. And what happens... Um, and what starts to happen is now, remember those Palestinians that replaced the Jews in those homes and that land? Remember, it was originally Jewish in East Jerusalem. So anyways, so now those Palestinians are not under Jordanian control. Now they're under Israeli occupation. Oh, charm. Thank you. Um, you're being very charming today. So now they're under now they're under Israeli occupation. Very different. Now they weren't treated well by Jordan. Now they're definitely not being treated well by Israel. So you can imagine how they feel. Now transport to now, today, there are Israeli court cases going on. And there was a court case basically, um, and they won in like the pretty sure the lower court uh, court system. And there's so they won in the lower court system where that um, the land itself was stolen, right? Was was stolen by Jordan. It wasn't inherently theirs because it orig was originally owned by Jews. So Israel was going to take it on behalf of, the Jew of those Jews, right? And, you know, and put back Jewish homes there. It is very, does that remind you of anything? I, I know you're probably thinking, oh, Ares. That sounds so crazy, but like, I don't understand. Like, wouldn't it be really unfair to punish the Palestinians who live in their homes right now for the fact that, you know, Jews got kicked out of there, you know, 70, 80 years ago? Sorry, 80 years ago? It's not their fault. Why are, why do they get punished? Well, let me tell you, okay, it's because of ran, land reallocation trends that are starting to happen everywhere. This is why that concept has problems. Now, this is a, pro a concept that is existing in South Africa and a bunch of places in Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, it's a concept that is also starting to become very prevalent now in the Americas. Whoa, Charmo, thank you for gifting that sub to Turing. Welcome to the aristocracy. Yeah, no, of course it's still unfair. I think it's unfair, right? Um, now, this is the problem. I don't think that you right the wrongs of the past by creating a new wrong. Like, to me, you just perpetuate the cycle of violence. It's why I don't like, um, I guess, certain definitions of what land back movements are and stuff. Certain definitions. I've heard some definitions that sound good, but it depends obviously on, on the way that happens. But I don't believe in just like reallocating um, land and punishing people for, you know, the crimes of their ancestors or et cetera, like that. I think that's really, really problematic. Um, there are other ways that you can create justice and create more ec equitable situations like, um, uh, like a oh my god the word is escaping me something with an r re when you said give back money reparation thank you miss l i love you thank you reparations okay it was just like totally out of my mind 
um, I think reparations are normally a better way to, to go about this, right? Um, than just simply literally creating another ethnic cleansing. So anyway, so they decided that they thought it was a really good idea. So let's right the wrong of Jews being kicked out of their land in Jordan um, when Jordan controlled East Jerusalem. And let's right that wrong by creating, and because we can all agree that was shitty. It was shitty for Jews to lose their land in that situation, right? Um, okay, but let's right that wrong by kicking more people out of their land. By kicking more people out of their homes, right? That sounds like a great idea. So, I fought with this idea, what do you tell to the people who claim this land? By law, it should be given back to them. I mean, that's the pro like, by law, like, what does that mean? We have to analyze by law. Um, and this is the issue. Okay, so if we say, sure, we say that the Jews should be given back their land that was taken from them by Jordan, right, and by those Palestinians, then what about all the land that was taken by, from, by Israelis from Palestinians in 1967 too? What about the West Bank? What about Gaza? You know, what about other neighborhoods in East Jerusalem? There were neighborhoods in East Jerusalem where Palestinians were also kicked out. Right? So it's like, this is why that was so unfair. It's like, because they're only kind of redistributing and righting the wrongs of the past for the Jews who lost their land. They're not doing the same thing for the Muslims and the Palestinians. And I mean, that makes sense because it's Israel. <laughs> They're going to care about their own, right? But that's shitty. I just think in general, it's not a good idea. And that's why it's really, really unfair. And that's like why it was such a, a big problem. You have to go back to the wall and ask God to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, it's a joke. Yeah, I should. But though I do not want to be in Israel right now. Um, I have family in Jerusalem and I am scared for them with what is going on. But yeah, anyways... That was a long kind of history about um, that neighborhood. So that was going on. We all know the last two weeks, that's been kind of like the news that's been going on um, about that neighborhood in East Jerusalem. So the Israeli courts awarded, um, uh, you know, that they awarded that this land was going to be reallocated to Jews. No, the majority of Israelis do not support kill all Arabs. Um, yeah, just so you guys know, when I'm talking about, like, I, I'm going to be very specific when I talk about Israelis. You can relax. Jerusalem was quiet today. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems to be it was, it was better. But yeah, yesterday was absolutely crazy with what was going on. Now, so you can imagine the tension that's going on with, um, with Israel and, um, the tension that's going on, like Palestinians are very upset because a lot of news is being spread that they're just being kicked out of their homes. So you can imagine lots of Palestinians are like, oh, we're just being kicked out of our homes because we're Palestinian. So, um, you know, and it started to spread like wildfire. So there was already a lot of frustration. Now on the other side and the Jewish nationalist side, Jewish nationalists are seeing this as a great sign because Jewish nationalists believe in a kind of, I don't know if this is the right term to use, but like a greater Israel, right? Where they want to take basically the areas of land that were originally allocated to the, to the Jews in the Bible. Now, this is, a, Israel actually is only, a, what is right now, Israel is a tiny portion of that. It would include like half of Jordan, parts of Egypt, all that stuff. Okay, Affinity, I don't know why you keep saying Zion. Zionism has many different iterations and different histories. It is an extreme form of Zionism, right? But saying it's Zionism is as ridiculous as just saying, like, when I'm saying something and saying, like, oh, like, well, that's Islamic. Like, there's many different forms of Islam. So it's like, it's just a silly thing to say. Yeah, I heard about that, Fenixie. It's, yeah, that's super ridiculous. See you, Chijoki. So, um, where was I? You guys distracted me. So the G so basically, tensions are really, really high, um, and up comes 
And those two stories, right? Those two stories of what I just told you, they come together on Jerusalem Day. And on top of that, what's going on during Jerusalem Day is Ramadan. During Ramadan, a lot, a lot of Muslims. Do you believe Palestine is a country? Like what? I believe Palestine should be a country. I believe Israel should stay a country. I believe in a two-state solution. Though it feels like every day we're getting further and further from that. Um, but that is, that is my hope. So, um, so it comes to Jerusalem yesterday, Jerusalem day. And those two issues have just kind of like culminated to a head in terms of the tensions, especially in the city of Jerusalem. Now it's also Ramadan. So a lot of Palestinians, um, and Palestinian Muslims and, um, Arab Israelis, they are um, religiously observing Ramadan and they're praying at Alaska mosque. So they're praying there a lot. Now there had been rumors now, like Israelis, if you're in chat or Palestinians, like feel free to correct me. Um, I know the basic details of what happened, but this is to my knowledge what happened is that um, there had already been rumors The every year, the Jewish nationalist kind of groups, they form like a march where they kind of like march down on Jerusalem and they advocate for trying to get control um, of the Temple Mount and they celebrate getting control of all of Jerusalem. Hey, Amos, um, they get control of the whole area and all that stuff. You know, the flag march, big Jewish nationalist kind of um, march. I'll show you guys, show you guys this. It's a very like big, um, big deal in Jewish nationalist cir circles, right? They are very extremely right wing on the Zionist scale. Just for perspective. Yeah, it's not intended to be racist, but it comes off as like, yeah, it's like everything. The flag march is actually a mainstream thing. Well, anyway, so and what ends up happening is what ends up happening is um, they start the march and they plan the march to take it to the Temple Mount. And the Israeli police and Israeli Shin Bet, Shin Bet is basically the Mossad, but for inside Israel. So it's like the security intelligence and stuff within Israel. So they find out. Now, I know you're like, what? I don't understand. You're talking about two different types of Jews. That's so confusing. I thought Jews were all one monolith in Israel. No, they're not. Right. So like sometimes the Jewish nationalists, like these groups are very, very against the Israeli government, almost like how America has groups that are pro American government and against the American government. Right. Like it's lots of complexities there. I know it's crazy. Um, so, yeah, you don't want to just group all the Jews, Jews together. So I know it's totally insane. So um, the Israeli police had found out about this going on. The Shin Bet had gone on about what was uh, found out about this. They found out that there were also concerns um, uh, about it. And also Muslim groups, right, um, who worship at the who worship at Al-Aqsa Mosque start finding out about this happening. Um, this being planned. So they start stockpiling quote unquote weapons, right? Now they don't really have access to many weapons. So their version of weapons are like fireworks, rocks, random pieces of furniture, etc. They stock stockpiling like those kinds of quote unquote weapons, um, in the mosque and around the mosque. Um, anyways, so Israel starts preparing cause they know that this march is supposed to be peaceful, but they have a feeling it's not going to be. Um, especially when you're getting two nationalist groups together who hate each other, it's probably going to go badly, right? Well, it does. So anyways, um, it technically the police were there to protect both parties, right? Now, obviously Palestinians who, and Muslims who are worshiping at the Al-Aqsa mosque, they don't really see Israeli police as their protectors. Right. They keep in mind there is a lot of systematic re systemic racism in um, in Israel against Muslims, against Arabs. Um, they have similar concerns about the police, the way black people have concerns about the police in the United States. Um, so they get really concerned. Now, we don't know technically who kind of shoots first. 
right? Um, or who like makes the first, you know, groups like, so some Palestinians or some Muslims, there's, it's, it's depending on your politics, you call them differently. So I'll just, I'll just call them Muslims um, for the sake, because they're probably Muslim if they're praying at the al Aqsa Mosque, um, is they start launching um, rocks and fireworks um, straight at um, Israeli um, police and soldiers that are there to, you know, you know, protect the peace, right? Um, and in um, and on top of that, there started being uh, also violent um, uh, rioting from the Israeli nationalists that I was talking about, the Jewish nationalists. And then on top of that, now the police who are armed with like rubber bullets and tear gas and all the shit that, you know, you normally see militarized police armed with in the United States, very, very similar in Israel. They start, you know, doing the thing of what we know police do in these riot situations. Um, now, I just want to reiterate. Whoa. Holy shit. That is a huge contribution on Patreon. Thank you. Holy shit. Thank you. Wow. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna send you a message later to thank you for that. That that means a lot. So now I wanna reiterate C pick, thank you so much for subbing with Prime. I appreciate it. Now I want to tell you guys that I do not know who shot first, right? Or who launched the first like who who made it violent first. In my experience in a lot of these situations, it's usually just one rogue person and you know and someone else overreacts and these things happen but for all i know it might have been the israeli police or the you know the israeli um you know um military forces that were in the region i'm not sure about the details of that um they might have been the one to be or over aggressive maybe they pushed someone down maybe they beat someone up there is a video of them beating up a palestinian right we don't like it might have been the jewish nationalists it might have been like I, we actually like there's so many counter stories right now because this just happened i'm hearing so many stories of like and i'll give you an example soon about how one story is just kind of changed the narrative just gets molded and molded you know based on which media publication is going to post it so it's like it's very very hard to know what exactly happened so that is like and this is a big point of contention because obviously Palestinians and the things that you're seeing on Twitter on the, you know, pro-Palestine side are saying that like they're framing this like the Israeli government has launched an invasion um, onto Al-Aqsa Mosque um, and they're trying to basically destroy the mosque. Right now, obviously, if you could hear this, hear what I said, it's unlikely, though it's certainly possible. Right. But it's unlikely with what I said. But um, I can understand why Palestinians would think that, right? If, if Israel, for example, um, was first to be, you know, particularly aggressive or they overreacted to a Palestinian or something, doing something. Does it matter who threw the first stone? I think it does. Um, I, I think it does because when it comes to intention. Um, so it's not, but it's not the whole story. Even if, say, a Palestinian did, say, throw the first stone, um, you can still say that Israel overreacted to it. You can still say that Israel broke international law when it, like, engaged in it. And then somehow, you know, when the police get involved and, you know, they're, st they're getting rockets and, th and rocks and things, like, thrown at them. And I don't want you guys to, they're not, like, little rocks, right? Like, these are rocks that can kill someone, um, like, when you throw them, right? So... Uh, Jerusalem stone is really fucking gruesome. Um, so, um, you can also say that Israel provoked this reaction. Yeah, yeah. There's like, basically the story I'm telling you, you can actually paint that narrative any way you want. You can paint this narrative in a pro-Israel direction. You can paint this narrative in an anti-Israel direction. Um, and that's kind of being this whole thing. This is why you're seeing so many different stories coming up. And I'm not telling you how to think. Right. Like, I'm not telling you. I'm just telling you what I know about the situation so far. Yeah. Multiple endings. So, um, yeah, no, the, the stones are intense. Like, I don't want you to think they're like these just tiny stones. Um, and but anyways, but keep in mind, the stones are big, 
but Israel has tear gas like the israeli police have tear gas and all this stuff and on top of that you have the Jew jewish nationalist groups now is the israeli forces were supposed to be there to keep the peace and protect the muslim worshipers from the Isra from the jewish nationalists right um and it doesn't work out that way anyways so the clash starts happening and somehow we'll look up i want to find Somehow, over 300 Palestinians end up dead. I'm pretty sure that's the number. It keeps changing. Now, that's not the article. There's, if you guys want a good source that I, um, oh, here, no, this isn't. Okay, somehow over 300 Palestinians end up dead. Um, guys, if you know the exact number, please put it in chat. Yeah, no, there's a lot of people in Alaska Mosque. I'm pretty sure dead. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it was dead. I might, I'm tr I'm just trying to find out what the exact number is. Someone wants to just double check. I think that, um, I thought it was injured. Let's look it up. Yeah, I just, oh, 24 dead in later era. I, okay. I thought I remember hearing that they were dead, but I, yeah, I might be wrong. Oh yeah, over 205 said. I tweeted about it. Wasn't there like a, yeah, I just, I don't want to be spreading misinformation. So that's why I want to double check this. Cause there's so many facts and it's hard to get not to get things wrong oh yeah injured you're right um injured with uh 205 hospitalized see i'm i literally fact check myself okay <laughs> my old tweets fact check myself <laughs> um so uh nine hamas terrorists dead by precision airstrike um yeah that's true um and yeah and then there were further further deaths now like Anyways, so somehow so many Palestinians end up injured. The videos from the place are horrific to watch. I'm not going to put them on because they might yeah, get me in trouble. You can look them up. So. Um, yeah, several kids were killed. So what ends up happening afterwards um, is... When news of what's going on starts spreading around the world, um, obviously there's a lot, a lot of people are upset about it, right? And when news starts spreading around, um, both Hamas and, um, and Fatah offer a rare joint statement. They, they offer a rare joint statement where they give Israel an ultimatum if um, Israel, like, like, if you don't remove Israeli forces from the mosque by 4 p.m., I think it was 4 p.m. in the evening, um, uh, is, like, there will be hell to pay. Something like that. It was some kind of, um, like, message like that. I mean, we know Israel doesn't, is not going to respond well to that. So what it does Israel do? Um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't listen. <laughs> Um, uh, Palestinians do get taken to the hospital and all that stuff, um, uh, because of the area and, um, and Hamas immediately starts launching, was it 6 p.m.? Yeah. And then immediately, and then Hamas starts launching rockets. Um, so Hamas starts just launching rockets. Now when Hamas launches rockets, it's, and they're launching rockets from Gaza and they're indiscriminate. So they can hit anywhere within, you know, close regions. So they could hit like a children's school. They could hit, um, you know, a cornfield. They could hit um, an Israeli embassy. They could hit anything, right? It's like completely indiscriminate, which is why it's a war crime. You're not allowed to do that. You need to, you need to target your missiles. Um, 
the joint statement was made by who? Um, Fatah and Hamas. So, um, they launched that. They they launched that anyways. Um, and now, for those who don't know, Israel has the system called the Iron Dome. I'll show you guys how the Iron Dome works, but it's basically this. It's a really actually fascinating piece of technology. I will show you. Um, da, da, da. Just warning you guys, this comes from the Israeli Defense Forces, you know, it's a great source. Why am I watching this? Sorry, chill out with the tabs. Why does everyone hate my tabs? Okay, so the this is the, how the Iron Dome works, right? When um, when Hamas launches rockets um, from there, when Hamas like launches rockets from uh, from Gaza, um, they can just land indiscriminately anywhere. The Iron Dome um, has the ability to automatically sense these rockets in the air, and then it launches like a counter rocket to counter. Oh, sorry, this is really loud. So you guys can see here. So those are the rockets in the air. And now they're getting countered by counter rockets. And they it's actually fascinating how these work because they always like connect it. If someone knows like the details of how this works, it's like fascinating. Regardless of your politics, it's fucking great. I'm sure the Palestinians wish they had this. I, I almost wish they had it for them too. It would save a lot of their lives. Anyways, this system saves a lot of Israeli lives. Now, if this system wasn't in place, then a lot of Israelis w would be dead. Because you're probably thinking, oh, like, why, is, why are there so many Palestinians um, dying in comparison with Israel? No, my phone didn't ring. It was just the, it was the sirens. These are the sirens that are going. Yeah, the Iron Dome is very cool. Um, but you have to understand that one of the main reasons why Israel doesn't lose as many civilians anymore, it used to le lose a lot of civilians, and it doesn't because it has the means to be able to protect their civilians. So they have bomb shelters, as one of our viewers mentioned, they went into the bomb shelters, they have the Iron Dome, they have like uh, sirens, they have like whole systems. Now, um, Palestine is in a tougher situation for protecting their civilians, particularly in Gaza, because in Gaza, um, they are incredibly densely populated, right? This is like one of the densest zones in the world. So there is very little there and they don't have extra resources. I mean, because of the situations they're in to really protect their citizens to that level. And this is why when Israel literally, even though Israel is not targeting specifically civilians, um, they're usually targeting Hamas like, uh, sections. Um, just by default, you blow up anything in Gaza, you're going to kill someone because to kill someone that's innocent. And that's the unfortunate truth. That's why bombing Gaza is so irresponsible because of so how dense the area is. Like no matter how targeted you are, unless you literally are like, you know, Russian KGB level, take a, you know, um, take an injection with a, um, an umbrella. If you go and do like any kind of targeting, you are going to accidentally kill civilians. This is like one of the biggest issues. So in one of these airstrikes, so and Israel has a policy that when um, Gaza starts getting attacked, um, sorry, when Gaza starts attacking, Hamas starts attacking um, with the with the rockets, Israel responds with bombs, and their bombs are targeted. But they, they respond with the bombs, and then what happens with these bombs, as I mentioned, is a lot of innocent people get killed. And so I'm pretty sure, what was the number, 20-something? Palestinians were dead, and I know six of them were children. And this is obviously really gross and really sad. Israelis always say Hamas fire from the population center to use them as shields. Any idea of its true propaganda? It has been true in the past. I don't know if it's true now. Um, I do know that um, like Hamas had used like specifically high densely populated areas of Gaza as like shields as a way to um, prevent Israel from wanting to bomb those areas. But I don't know if they do that anymore. 
Um, okay. But regardless, right? Even if Hamas is doing that, it's like, yeah, it's not the Palestinians' fault, right? Um, so, anyways. And you could say, oh, well, Palestinians in Gaza voted for Hamas. Well, we've talked about in this, we talked about in the stream why it is so challenging for Palestinians to vote for Fatah and all the problems with Fatah. They are basically faced with two really shitty options. And Fatah has, on average, um, uh, been seen as ineffective um, with liberating uh, the Palestinians. Do Hamas have any area to fire from that aren't populated by civilians? Yeah, they do. Yes, they do. There are some areas. But Hamas does not... Hamas doesn't really care about Palestinians. So it doesn't... Um, so they don't put any effort into protecting Palestinians. Daniel asking, why were the Israelis celebrating the fires at Alaska Mosque? Um, I, I, I mean, I think there were radical groups on both sides, unfortunately, that were celebrating the pain and anguish of the other. That's the, the sad truth. Um, I don't think Israelis as a whole were, but I do think there were probably extremist groups on both sides that were doing that. Um, it's not both sides. I'm not saying both sides are equal. I'm just saying when it comes to the celebrating, like, you know, like horrific crimes or something. Anyways. So now you basically have what, to me, feels like another Gaza war. And another, I mean, war in general, because now there's a war in Jerusalem. I'm not saying that there's both sides going like it's equal on both sides. It's not what I'm saying. Look for the entire conflict. I was just saying if when the guy literally brought up um, Israelis dancing in the streets, like joyous at a, um, joyous at the deaths of a, uh, um, you know, of Palestinians and destroying, you know, and what happened in the mosque. And that is just, it's just not true that the majority of Israelis do that. And there have been cases on both sides for that specific issue. As far as I heard, the fires were caused by the Palestinians themselves. So everyone here kind of like, ha, oh, they're burning down their own stuff down. Yeah, I mean, we don't really know who started these fires. I mean, like, uh, the there were fireworks. So maybe they were accidental fires. It's like, there's so much that is up in the air about this conflict, about like what's happening right now. It is like, and as I delve into it, all I could, all I felt was just sadness. Just like watching this incredibly holy city just be destroyed. And I'll give you an example guys of how, why it's so challenging to find out what's happening. So did you guys see the video? I'm sure a few of you saw. There's a video, I'm not gonna show it on stream because I think it's probably TOS breaking. Um, there is a video of, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to describe it, but um, of a Jewish quote unquote settler, that's usually how they're being referred to on Israel, uh, on Twitter, um, driving his car to run over Palestinians, right? As like a terrorist, because I mean, that would be terrorism. Why funds state of Israel sympathizer? Like, holy shit, like the way, some of the way people are talking, it's like, dude, like the way we talk here is like, I'm not a political person. Um, I am here just to, you know, talk about the history of the region and what's going on. So we are all trying to learn together. So yeah, I know that this is a heavy topic. I know that this is really intense, um, but that kind of tribalism is just not, a thing I want in my community. This is a community of multiple people from different areas of Israelis and Palestinians. We're just all are all hoping for peace. Um, and yeah, we're not going to deal with that kind of tribalistic bullshit. I'm going to call out Israel when it deserves to be called out. I'm not going to kind of just, you know, um, push some uh, virtue signaling bullshit that you've been seeing on Twitter. Yeah, and so night was I was gonna get into that. So there's a video kind of going viral of um, this uh, of a Jewish quote unquote settler like um, you know driving over Palestinians, right? I think he drove. I think he hit one Palestinian. Sorry, I shouldn't say multiple Palestinians. 
um, uh, during like yesterday because there was like a lot of rioting just like going on in general. Now, if you watch the whole video in the beginning, he's having rocks thrown at him and he's just trying to get out and he's lost control of his car. Right? And then on top of that, people are forcibly pulling open his car door and trying to pull him out. He ends up getting pulled out and getting beaten up. However, so that part of the clip goes viral in Jewish communities. And so now you have these two narratives of the same story, right? Israeli, you know, settler terrorist running over innocent Palestinian versus innocent is um, innocent Jew pulled out of his car, thrown rocks at, and beaten up by Palestinians. And this is just a demonstration of the, how the situation, like how the exact, how just one situation can have two totally different narratives. And you're probably like, oh, Eris, Eris, please, you're all knowing, you know everything. Um, please go sub, uh, sub mode. We can maybe do follower only mode or something. Probably like, oh, Eris, like, please, like, tell us which one is correct. I don't fucking know, guys. I don't know which one's correct because I've seen, like, even when I watched the whole clip, it's like, I don't know if there was a clip before that of, you know, rocks being thrown at him. I don't know if there was a clip before that of him yelling out slurs and actually running over someone else. Like, I don't know. And this is why it's like, right now, it's like, so much news is, and this is one of the problems when you're a historian, um, and this is... Um, yeah, this is one of the problems when you're a historian of trying to look at this issue is when, when as historians, we're, we're always trying to delve really deep into topics and examine all these sources, compare the sources, compare the validity of the sources. You don't get to do that with a current event. That's a luxury that is afforded to events in the past. Yeah, no, Steigen, normally the chat, my, normally my community, my community is so chill. This is not my community. These are just like random people that are very, their emotions are intense. I don't even blame them. I understand emotions are really high right now. This is a very, very intense, controversial issue. So I understand why people are upset. So. No, if you aren't a 100% supporter, no matter what, then you don't get to have an open discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, like, I'm just trying to demonstrate there's so much news coming in that's, like, and I just want to let you guys know that, like, most sources that people use for this shit are totally bullshit. Don't trust Al Jazeera, okay? Don't trust, okay, um, the Jerusalem Post, okay? Israel Times has tons of biases, okay? Don't trust Fox News. Um, BBC is, like, eh, it's like milk toast. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, Young Turks is, lies sometimes, was probably more rational than Al Jazeera. Um, they're just like, yeah, there's just so much false news being spread. And, um, yeah, The Guardian also, like, a lot of bullshit. Uh, like, there's like, everyone's kind of just taken over and this is one of the problems with our internet age is that people just care about making the title that's gonna go no one likes nu nuance does not get um does not get clicks right so it does not get clicks so anyways um just in general like there is a source that i personally prefer i prefer two sources i like the new york times um Though New York Times is not being great on this one, particularly. And my favorite is Haaretz. I know Haaretz is a very, very left wing. It's like, I mean, it's got, it's basically the New York Times of Israel. It's, it's got a left wing kind of bias. I mean, all papers are going to have a bias, but it has, a, just for context, if you think, oh, it's an Israeli paper and must be really pro Israel, well, it's like very, 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 um, it's very, very, very critical of Israel. Okay, Nightways, I was pronouncing it with my Canadian accent. Haaretz, you happy? Um, so a lot of, like, for example, my, my father, like, dad, if you're watching this, he's probably like, oh, like, Eris, like, why are you pushing, 
you know, why are you pushing Haaretz? It hates Israel. It hates its own people. Like, like that's a, Haaretz is just, it's not, it's willing to criticize, um, it's willing to criticize, uh, you know, Israel. It's willing to criticize Palestinians. It's like, um, I don't know. It's, it's the best that we have, even though it's still, you know, it's still flawed like anything. I prefer the socialist paper that hates Israel. Okay, I think that's a joke. We have proof New York Times doesn't really, yeah, I mean, there's proof, like, a lot of, none of these papers, all these sources are shitty, like, trust me. Um, and I will still read Al Jazeera sometimes, like, I, Al Jazeera sometimes does good work, right? Um, but they have a really, really heavy bias. Um, and just, like, just watching their, co their coverage is they're very dishonest in the terms they use. For example, they refer to all Israelis as settlers, which is, like, a very problematic thing to use in a legal sense because then you can't distinguish people who are breaking like Jewish settlers who are breaking international law. The Aris Times is a source you could trust. Well, honestly, like, but I'm just giving you guys a situation that like, there's just, I am trying to find out what's going on and it's so hard to know. What I do know, what I do know is that it is awful what's going on and it's horrific and um you guys know that feeling that you get in your chest and you're going through something really shitty in a personal way like you like feel it i've had that feeling for like the past two days i because um i was just on a panel sunday night you guys can see the youtube video where i talked about how i really felt like you know things were moving in a better direction um that the you know especially getting to talk to the Palestinian viewers that I have, um, that I had really high hopes for the next generation of Palestinians. Um, and again, because they are so incredibly educated, they are the highest, like, per capita educated population on earth. And, uh, you know, I had hopes uh, with Israel too, and they just got all shattered within hours of that, that panel. And um, when this start stuff got started going on, and I just got really, really sad. I just got really, really sad. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with the situation, and it's like the fact that I mean, I knew when something happened in Jerusalem, it was just going to reverberate outside. And so now I know on campus there's going to be more fights between Jews and Muslims. There's going to be more fights between um, pro-Israel, anti-Israel. Like it, everything is just inflamed again. It feels like another intifada. Um, the intifada was not a good time. And um, the sad thing is the effect of the intifada was that the Palestinians were put in an even a worse situation afterwards. What happens after the second intifada? The wall gets built, right? Um, there starts being more checkpoints, right? Palestinians are discriminating against even more. And so I feel like this might be the last, um, I'm worried that this might be the last nail in the coffin to a potential Palestinian state. Because this stuff is playing right into Netanyahu's hands, and now I'm feeling like he's probably going to win the election. It's like, well, if the election was going on right now, he would have won. What are the legal arguments for the Israeli courts to evict the Palestinians causing the protests? Um, Umar, did you were you here here earlier? Um, it, it's basically um, land reallocation, similar to like land back um, uh, fights for indigenous people and stuff, because the land was originally owned by Jews. Um, that's exactly the intention. They see every Israel, including those within the Green Line, as settler. Yeah, Mizel, and that's a it's a very problematic way to look at it. Even if you believe morally they're settlers, they're not legally that. So it's like it's it's problematic to be telling the news when you've already taken this massive bias that breaks with international law. Um, I actually follow a page in Israel um, that publishes stories in Hebrew, so I could see their their spin on things. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's probably killed the new government in Israel, so at least another half a year of BB. Last nail, it's just the last round of Gaza stuff. We literally have that every four years. I don't know, Nightwiz, this feels different. The level of the conflict that happened in Jerusalem, this feels very different. Is this the I a risk of IDF moving towards Gaza occupation? Um, yeah. Yeah.
you know? Um, the truth is, if you really care about the Palestinians, like, right now, the Palestinians are in a losing situation, and that is just the truth, right? Israel, regardless of your personal politics, Israel is there to stay. Israel has nukes, and Israel is not going anywhere. So, like, this, this, this is why anyone who was trying to advocate for the Palestinians by arguing that Israel needs to be wiped off the map is not helping Palestinians. All that does is hurt Palestinians because you play into the right wing of Israel's hands. You play into those extremist Zionist narratives um, that, you know, that Palestinians are just trying to wipe off Israel. This is one of the biggest problems. I find it very hard to avoid arguing with the most anti-Semitic people here. How do you handle it, given you're the center of this because it's your stream? I'm um, all like, I just, my skin is thick with this stuff. I am used to it. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. It's, uh, yeah, it's not easy. But um, there's nothing like sitting on a cushy um, seat in my peaceful town in Canada um, to remind me of my privilege and to tell me how grateful I am that my parents brought me to this country and away from war. They did not want me to go to the army and they didn't want me to live in that kind of war. I am very grateful for that. Hamas is just inciting violence and tantrum because the elections were postponed. Yeah, at night was, I agree with you. Probably. It's very true. So people that say Israel doesn't exist, like... Yeah, no, I mean, but that's the problem with publications like Al Jazeera because they're spreading those narratives. And you're seeing that on, tw on Twitter where everyone's like, oh, like, Israel needs to be wiped off the map. Israel's an Ill illegitimate state. Well, I have news for you guys. Almost all nations are illegitimate. That's the fucking truth. Almost all states are illegitimate. All states are founded, the entire concept of nationalism, states are founded on um, theft of land. Nash all nationalism is based off of one group having power over other groups. Find me, I literally cannot think of a nation off the top of my head that was not founded on some kind of ethnic cleansing or blood of another group. That doesn't diminish what happened to the Palestinians. It's gross, and I hope that those rights are wronged. Sorry, I hope that those wrongs are rights. That was such a bad way to say it. Um, and the, I hope that that is it fixed, and I can tell you about the solutions I have in theory. Um, but, but yeah, Israel, at the end of the day, in our current nationalist society, and with Israel having nukes, it is there to stay. So the question is, right? How can we help Palestinians while keeping in mind that Israel is there to stay? And that is like the debate moving forward. Now, they're obviously different. Now, this is this is where the area of expertise that I have go away. So you can say, oh, let's boycott them. I can tell you I have problems with the organization of BDS, but Boycotting has been very effective in the past, right? So you can still boycott Israel and not support the specific organization of BDS. I mean, plenty of people still support Black Lives Matter, even though they have a problem with the Black Lives Matter organization in their city. Um, so it's certainly possible. Um, it's worked in the past to work with South Africa. Um, it's worked in other situations, but it's also not worked in plenty of situations. People have been boycotting China for a very long time. It's never been effective. Um, and it's, I have a hard time thinking it'll be effective with Israel, but I might be wrong. That is not my area of expertise. So, um, other solutions, I mean, I mean, you could take the hippie solution that I often really lean towards because you guys know I'm fucking warm and cuddly and tree hugging, um, which is, you know, promoting Israeli and Palestinian art, promoting education, promoting storytelling and de-radicalizing both groups, particularly de-radicalizing Palestinians and Israelis, like, because the more you de-radicalize Palestinians, the more Israelis get de-radicalized, and the more, the less they're concerned about their security, and the more they want to do peace. So, and I think that 
telling Palestinian stories to Israelis is a big part of that. Um, there is this amazing website called, I think, Nakba.org or something, where it is just a historical record um, of videotapes of the interviews of uh, survivors and victims of the Nakba, which is, you know, the when Palestinians were ethnically cleansed in 1948. And hearing their stories is very powerful, and I wish more Israelis would, and I wish more Jews would, because um, if there is a group of population that knows what that's like, it's Jews. Not saying it's equivalent to what the Nazis did, but Jews know what it's like to be oppressed, to be kicked out of your homes, to have war crimes happen to you. So I wish, I wish that more Israelis would have more sympathy for Palestinians. Um, and the problem is, it's very hard to have sympathy when you know you feel like you are under threat. Because trauma and survival and fear makes you self-focused. We know that this happens. You're very worried about the you're not never not worried about the neighbor next door when you're concerned that you're getting bombed. That's why the culture of boycott is bullshit. Hey Peter, see ya. Thanks for checking out the chat. History will have to say Israel will be guarded as apartheid South Africa is regarded. Um I don't think what Israel is going okay. So I don't think what is going on in Israel is an apartheid system. Now you're probably like, oh, like, Eris, like, that's such bullshit, it's apartheid, it's apartheid, right? The thing is, is that I just feel like it's a bad analogy, because I actually think, now, I actually come from South Africa, so I know a little bit about apartheid. Um, I grew up being taught about the history of apartheid and what it did to South Africa. Um, and I can tell you, I don't think it's a good analogy, because in some ways, the situation in Palestine uh, with Palestinians is worse than apartheid. In some, and in some situations, it's better. But I can tell you that um, in apartheid South Africa, you know, black communities were not being regularly bombed um, and uh, were not being regularly bombed and having walls just put up in the middle of their neighborhoods um, and being sectioned off into this tiny section that they could never leave, right? So in some ways it's worse and in some ways it's better because of course Arab Israelis have many more rights in Israel than blacks um, that black people had in South Africa. So it's like, it's just a poor analogy to me because it just, what, and the whole purpose of an analogy is to demonstrate like the truth, the inner truth of a situation. And I just don't think it demonstrates that situation. I think it's almost like a dishonest. On top of that, it also like, there's also a legal reason why like the analogy is dumb. And I, I, I could get into that another time. That's the main issue I have with the way history is taught in Israel, especially the Holocaust. The main takeaway, the way they are telling it is that we should always be afraid and thus whatever means necessary to defend us. Yep, that is true. I can tell you that um, a, a huge part of being raised Jewish is to be raised in fear. I mean, the Jews in the chat, we like, if you were raised in a Jewish community, you know what I'm saying is true. You are, I mean, all of our holidays are someone tried, like literally all of our holidays are someone tried to kill us, we survived. Someone tried to kill us, we survived. Chanukah, Purim, like every, like Passover, like every single, I literally, I can't think of a holiday, it's not about that. So, um, and on top of that, um, there is, it's just like, we are a group of people that are just historically so immensely oppressed that we are traumatized in a generational sense. We're not the only group that is traumatized like that. A lot of groups are, right? Um, but Israelis and so Jews in general live very much in fear. And I think when you're looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, instead of just seeing Israelis as, oh, like they're just white settlers, which is just, it's not true. Like you need to look at it as this is an oppressed people um, that are very, very anxious about their survival. And trauma can lead, and we know this, right? Trauma can lead to further abuse of the person that's traumatized. Like, they can be start to abuse people because of that fear. If it's left, you know, untreated. And I'm pretty sure Israel, Israelis are not getting therapy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not going on. 
I think the problem with de-radicalization is even if the most extreme Palestinians stop with their rhetoric, Israeli far right will simply made from the ground up. It's a communist strategy in Europe and don't help against the. I, I mean, I agree. I disagree with that, Opacho. Um, Israel as a whole, like Israelis are, are taught that peace is so important. Um, literally, our greeting means peace. So is the Muslim reading. Um, in uh, the uh, Arabic reading is Salam Aleichem. Salam Aleichem. And uh, which means like peace be upon you. And you know what it is in Hebrew? Shalom Aleichem. Sounds really similar, doesn't it? Salam Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Right? They both mean peace be upon you. Um, so like at the heart of both of these cultures is wanting peace. Um, it's just like, it's easier said than done, especially when there's a lot of fucking fear involved. So don't just simply think, oh, like this is just a colonialist settler narrative. Like that is not what's going on. Um, but that also doesn't mean what Israel is doing is okay. Just because you take a nuanced view doesn't mean you have to both sides it, right? Or like act like it's just, important um rosh hashanah shavuot and sukkot those are agricultural ones yeah i guess that's true nightways why do you think that historically very anti-semitic european countries are the strongest supporters of israel um i think it's probably guilt um but i think it just happens to be that um anti-semitic countries um anti-semitism was most prevalent in europe originally and um, Europe is now very westernized and Israel became very westernized. Israel's a very western country in terms of its culture, in terms of its government structure and all that stuff. Um, it almost became an eastern style country. The Soviet Union actually supplied, a lot of people don't know this, but the main reason why Israel won the 1948 war besides for its secret ally alliance with Jordan um, was they were being supplied weaponry by Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was a state at the time, combined with the Slovaks of, and the Czechs. Um, and they said weaponry, and they were under the Iron Curtain, so they were a Soviet nation. And the Soviets were hoping that Israel would become a Soviet state, because originally most Zionists were labor Zionists. Very, very left-wing. They were hoping it would be a good outpost of a communist... I shouldn't say Soviet state, I meant communist state. Of communism in the Middle East. Of course, their style of communism is Marxist Leninism, right? Or Stalinism. Um, obviously, it didn't end up happening. Um, you know, uh, Soviets get mad and then they start funding Egypt instead. They uh, regularly funded both sides of wars, actually, in the early, in early days of Israel. You know, they're kind of like evil little puppeteers. I know a Chinese woman on Twitter who keeps getting, okay, um, who keeps uh, getting people arguing with her about the Uyghurs. She has nothing to do with it and keeps getting accused of being a genocide where All she could do is block people. Yep. Um, it's gross. It's gross. Um, I just ask you guys, like, I mean, I will probably do, a, I think I might do a whole stream, um, maybe this Friday, on how to criticize Israel and not be anti-Semitic. Um, cause a lot of people have those questions and it's a very complicated thing. So I, I, I might just do that on Friday and talk about, cause there's plenty of ways you can do it. And I think you're actually even more effective. If you really, if you care about helping Palestinians more so than just like, I don't know, um, virtue signaling on Twitter, like that's going to be the stream for you to watch that. But yeah. I want to look at really dumb Twitter take. I promise that I would look at this shit. Where's the Yang one? Okay. So where was the really infamous tweet that he made? Okay. So he makes this tweet. I'm standing with the people of Israel who are coming under bombardment um, attacks and condemn Hamas terrorists. The people of NYC will always stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel who face down terrorism and persevere. 
Can you guys all take a wild guess why? Do you think, okay, do you guys think Yang really cares that much about Israel? Like, can you all take a wild guess why Yang is making this tweet? Do you think he even gives a shit about the region? I doubt it. And I was, I was kind of sad to see this tweet because I like Dan. I like Dan because I really like universal basic income. Um, well, yeah, it's just because there, um, like literally there are more Jews in New York than there are Jews in Israel. Jewish populations in New York. Um, also, uh, now keep in mind, Jewish populations in New York are not a good descriptor of Jewish populations around the world, right? They're usually like, it's like the wealthiest of the Jewish population live in New York. And they're often very, 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 the communities in New York are very, very supportive of Israel. And he's running for mayor of New York. So it's like, for, it would have been political suicide for him to say something that was anti-Israel. So I don't even blame him for not saying like, you know, fuck Israel for what you're doing to Palestinians right now. Like, I don't blame him. Right? I don't blame him for not saying hashtag free Palestine. I get it. What I am blaming for him for, and what's really, really annoying, um, I'm not educated about Colombia. I'd have to research that next booms, but thank you. Um, but what is really, what, what is really, really annoying about Andrew Yang is he, there are so many tweets, like there's so many things that he could have said. Um, there's so many things he could have said that would have accomplished what he needed to as like a politician and also not be a dick. Um, oh, hey, Touring News. By the way, thanks for uh, tweeting me out. I saw that you did that. That was really cool. Um, so he could have said, you know, like, hopefully there is, you know, this time of war brings a time of peace or, you know, this, uh, the amount of violence saddens me. Like, you know, or like, hopefully there is peace in the Middle East. I don't know, something milk toast like that. Could have done something like that or... Um, we are against all forms of violence. Um, my heart, like, you know, I feel so bad for the Israelis and the Palestinians for what they're going through. Something like that. I don't know. But instead, you could have done such a milk toast. I'm sure you guys can all think of your good PC tweets. But instead, he fucking makes this tweet where he acts like Palestinians just do not exist. It's like they are nothing. Yeah, he could have been a centrist Andy, okay? Could have been a centrist Andy. Would have been totally whatever. I wouldn't have blamed him for it because, I mean, yeah, again, it's political suicide to do something like super anti-Israel or super pro-Palestinian um, in that uh, in that city. And instead, he just like he acts like Palestinians just don't exist. Like when how many Palestinians were injured? When the third the third most holy site. Uh, for Muslims is when they feel like that's under attack it's gone and like destroyed there's like violence in there regardless of whose original fault it is it's like you can't say that they're not going through something awful literally I was watching clips and I can't show them but there were like children around as like rubber bullets are being like shot at it everywhere and stuff and it was just like the Palestinians just did not exist to Yang like boom it's like they're just zero it's like Arab Israelis just didn't exist to him like, that's why, like, I could only imagine how I would feel seeing that as a Palestinian. Like, something so traumatic is going on. And not only does this guy not care about me, but he doesn't even mention me. In fact, he mentions the people that I see it as my oppressors. It's just shitty. It's just really, 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 really shitty. Um, and yeah, so... I was kind of unfortunate because I, I really liked Yang, so I was really, really disappointed um, in uh, what he had to say. Really disappointed. But you could see. Um, oh, you see Vasha's thing, he got more likes than me, you know? What the fuck, guys? You know, I love you, Vash, but you also called for, like, what, like the, the um, wiping out Israel or something? Would you still support Yang for NYC mayor after this? I don't know enough about the mayoral race. I don't live in New York, so. I don't know. Bosch said something very TOS about it. Yeah, he did. 
his fucking tweet reconsider gets 3.5 i write you know a very long perfect tweet only 572 likes like what the fuck is that about you know this is the real conflict right here Yeah, not sure Yang Gang is um, back him on that one. Yeah, that was a good one fight. Oh, and David Pakman's just like, let's do an interview. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be really interesting. Oh, God, I wish I could get Yang on for an interview. That would be cool as fuck. I like how you, you keep saying Bean. Yeah, I'm a Canadian. I gotta say Bean. You need more... Um... Oh, I know what you're saying. I, I see it. Bro, go for it. He has a horde of fans. To be fair, you shouldn't feel bad. No, my heart breaks. My heart breaks. But yeah, that's like, that's what really pissed me off. It, no, nothing really mentions this. It's like, just not mentioning the Palestinians. Like, and he, if he hadn't, he didn't need to mention Palestinians if he just like didn't mention Israelis. But because he mentioned like Israel, Hamas, and then he acts like Palestinian civilians like just don't exist. Like, Palestinian children just don't exist. I live in Ontario, Greg Smash. Um, it's the only important province in Ontario, in Canada. Okay, I'm kidding. Don't cancel me. Okay, don't cancel me, BCers and Quebecers. Are there any more provinces in Canada? I don't even know. Whoa. Oh my God, what the fuck? Why is Andrew Young a sub? Andrea, you are not welcome here. I am very mad at you.